Welcome to the new year, guys. Uh, this is uh, uh, a fun one to do. Uh, the fun part of one of the fun things about being in the Gamble studio in the day, which was this is 1976 for me, roughly, and uh, was the fact that he was an imaginative painter. And uh, so he was always making stuff up, uh, piecing it together, trying to make it look plausible. And we're talking about plausibility of, of the values, as you're asking about. So. And by the way, I hope you don't mind me calling you Syl. That sounds like a woman's name if you're not a woman. <laughs> you're, it, you're somebody else. But um, I, I would fall into calling you that whole long word with music, and it otherwise would drive me nuts probably. So I'm, using, I'm calling you Syl. Uh, but, um, but we've all, uh, you know, had that interest, and in, in not just temptation, to create pictures out of whole cloth. You know, imaginative painting is a thing, right? And um, so the illustrator, you know, routinely does it in theory, whether he uses photographs and pieces them together or how he might do it these days. <clears throat> we have all those examples from Maxfield Parrish to, um, and, and, and I really, you know, to, I was going to say to Norman Rockwell and Cornwell, Dean Cornwell and uh, Blashfield, all these people. Blashfield is a muralist, but he's doing the same thing as all these other guys, creating a plausible scene. And uh, it's, there's no question that Gamble's conversation with us was always one, and in his essays as well, was always one that was expressing a bit of frustration and not having more clarity about how to proceed when the same, in the very question you're asking here. Some of it might have had to do with, you know, is there a formula for the skin colors and the painting, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can see that some people like um, Jerome seem to have, have something like that, Bugro even, um, a basic color look for the skin, which seems to dominate through pictures. But I'm not going to tell you I'm speaking from a, uh, an I'm an impressionist. Although what you're seeing behind me is an imaginative work. I had a background, uh, I was going to let you be teased by this for a while, but I had a painting, I'm going to shut this down just a little bit so you can see it. But I had a background that I didn't like even a little bit as a study of a waterfall, and I decided to sort of mess around, just explore a little bit the creating of imaginative figures in a uh, in a background. So I made up these figures, which I'm not bragging about or anything, but there they are, trying to get them a size that makes sense in that setting and that sort of thing. Um, and this is going to be fairly typical of what goes on. But I am an impressionist, and if I'm a, if I'm piecing it together, I'm still doing it rather like what we talk about with with the oyster gatherers at Calais with. Degas, or you know, or the uh, I'm not with Degas, with Sargent. So, um, but I, you, we can look at that more, talk about it more. If that was that's one of those times, if somebody were here, you could ask me questions about it or something. It might be more useful. Uh, we're definitely going to figure that out. We're going to get to that. Uh, trying to do another thing like we did previous earlier. I'm with somebody having me look at his work, but in an in person among from among you guys. But keep that in mind. If somebody has something where they think it might be worthwhile, you can even propose it to me. Um, Here's the question put to us by Syl. Many great painters concocted their pictures in the studio after making many studies from life. How do you pull it all together value-wise when you're working in a large degree from imagination? It seems easy enough to see the values when painting directly from nature, but when working on an imaginary, and you really should say imaginary scenes, I suspect the problem becomes more complicated. We used to use the word not imaginary, but imaginative. Um, because, uh, but the scenes in your case here, the scenes are imaginary, they're imagined. So that's a good word. So, but we typically call this imaginative painting and it's different from painting from life, right? You know, you're not doing impressionism. Now I'm going to tell you as I must, because I'm a Boston school guy, that the mastery of the visual impression from life in studying nature, listening, talking to Ang or anybody, that's, that's the source. And for you to be master of, the, you know, have an ability to get the relationships and getting a strong sense of the unity of the visual impression in front of you is the introduction to unity overall. Now, you may just, when you're doing imaginative work, you may just resort to what feels right. And probably most of us actually do. That, does that feel plausible? And I think Degas uses a word like that. You know, what does he say? Your job is, uh, it's, it, it's all artifice, you know, it's all, but it's got to have the accent of truth. It's got to be plausible. And you can see the struggles he goes with in his early pictures. I'm not going to show you that stuff, but let's look at a couple of pictures and, and do this thing. I think we can do this pretty succinctly. You're talking specifically and mostly about values, but I'm going to talk about it in a couple other ways because unity is a product of more than that. 
And I'll just show you a handful of painters that are in the imaginative side. Let's just talk a little bit. Let's talk about Gamel first. Now, one thing I know about Gamel and this uh, is that he would create a stage, and it might have been a brick wall like this. He might have had his guy paint that brick wall. I'm not saying he did. I'm saying he might have. Or, but he might have had just a screen of a value X, and then he would put a model in front of it and paint that head, and then he would put another model in front of that and paint that head. And because it had enough background stuff that was there for both heads, you'd have naturally the unity if you're painting relationally. You're getting the color notes of the head and the foreground guy to be right to the background, and you're getting the other color notes of the other people to be right to that background, and in theory, at least, they should be right to each other. Um, one of the things you see in a lot of imaginative painting uh, is a unity of colors of the skin. And, uh, you know, so you might say, well, Gamel was trying to get each one of these people to be indi indi individuated, I guess is the word, to be individualized, to be, to be uh, uh, each one a real person in a real setting. And a lot of times people are just symbols. They represent in their more in their gesture than they do by being the model, Mrs., you know, uh, or something or other, you know. So his purpose wasn't necessarily to do a portrait of all these different guys and put them in a setting, but that was something that had something a little bit to do with the, uh, with the Ashcan school, though some of those guys working down there, and some of the guys uh, like Harry Dinnerstein, who I have just an enormous amount of respect for what he was struggling with uh, and what he produced, uh, in much the same way as Gamble. And Gamble actually t at one point met with him when I was at the, in New York. must have been in 76, 77, 78, somewhere. And... Uh, and commended his work and uh, the, uh, the sensible things that he did in creating the pictures. But in any case, what I'm saying, though, is that you can set up a setting in which there's a, something that's the anchor, and the anchor in this case might be the wall value or the wall color value. And then, and then you just paint everybody in front of that wall in the same light. And that's fairly classical, and you're going to get, if you're any kind of a relational uh, looker, <laughs> you know, if you know how to do your relationships of values, you're going to get that. You're going to have unity by that means. And I think that's one of the most common ones. <clears throat> what I did in the picture behind me wasn't, I had the background finished, but I didn't use models. These pictures, these images, as you can tell probably by looking at them, of the, of the nudes are just made up. So, um, and that's a bit of a gift that way. But it's been done several different ways by different people. So here's another one by Gamble. And he would have had people standing at different levels, presumably in the studio, to get the right angle on these guys. He would do drawings from them. Then he would trace them into his into the ground, background. I'm going to say now that was the background already drawn. Well, it had to have been. It had to have already been out there somewhere. And so did he do like, like let's, I think we have it right here. Uh, well, it doesn't show. But what Jerome did was he would have these, uh, these um, architectural draftsmen, um, what did they call them, um, uh, perspectivists, come in there and do the drawing for a particular room. And that whole thing would have been done from exactly the viewing point that Ang chose. And then he would set his figures in from, and he would look at them and paint them from that same place. And presumably, he would just be drawing each figure one at a time. My guess, I don't, I mean, I've seen studies that show him evolving the background at the same time as he's evolving the foreground, but there's not enough that I can say I'm definitive about any of that stuff. And I wouldn't even argue that every painter does it the same every time. But, um, but if he did something like what we see Poussin doing and created a shadow box and had the whole value scheme there, so that you can see this is a lost and found kind of a picture. It's a chiaroscuro thing. Lighter on one side, dark on the other, but it's got a, a whole bunch of lostness in the picture. So it's got this thing going on. It's preset. It's the box it's in. And so to get those values right and to get people sitting in front of it, he'd probably create that impression in his studio. He'd probably create create a dark side, create a shadow. Presumably his studio would have been plenty big to do that. Most of these guys were, and I haven't been in his studio. But, but uh, you could create the values that would have been in that room. You might have even had, in, not in his day, but later on, you might even have had photographs of areas like this to see what kind of values, if, especially if the building was torn down. Uh, what kind of values would have happened in that setting. Um, but the lighting would be made up and unified. It would be all coming from one place, presumably mo like most studio painting. One of the things I enjoyed about <clears throat> the, um, the movie uh, by Kubrick um, was the life of somebody or other. Um, you all have heard me talk about it before, but you might look it up. But it's, uh, 
is that he does this frequently single light source. He just has natural light or candles and things like that as they would have been in those settings. And if these guys were doing things like that, they would have had to set things up uh, to account for it, to show the multiple different kinds of lights. And that, of course, is what dictates your values. But in the case of, um, let's go ahead. In the case of Poussin, he does it in a shadow box that he talks about. He, put, he creates, he models figures. And I've done the same thing and even painted the figures up. I wanted to show you, but I, but I um, don't have them here. I have them in my studio for somebody else to look at to see how I did it. But I, we, I modeled up some figures and then uh, sort of like this guy here, uh, which you've seen in the background. I should set him here in the background to see if he amuses, if he look, can look plausible. <laughs> uh, here we go, except he won't sit on that stand. But uh, so you can see how something like this could be done. And you can say, does that look plausible? And of course, the painting is the knowing, you know, you have to do it to see if it's going to work. A lot of what I'm saying it really has to be done by trial and error. And it's your, you know, it's your, your ability to see the unity that say, does it look plausible? Uh, you're on your own <laughs> frequently. Uh, but he did, he would do these kinds of things. My guess is he painted up the drapery on them, or maybe he had dolls that were, uh, that had uh, dresses on them and those sorts of things, which wasn't an unusual thing with all sorts of imaginative painters. You either use models with the clothes or you had little mannequins that the clothes, and I've had mannequins made like that. I've had a drapery made for a painting I was working on. Um, this one was a painting of uh, Beatrice who was um, in a little bit of a symbolic painting uh, for a ceiling. It was from Dante's uh, Par uh, Paradiso, I think. Uh, but I had the drapery made by a doll maker to go on this particular mannequin, and then I was able to use it. Um, but, you know, so all the references to nature and all that sort of stuff, like in the painting I've got going on behind me here, but I wanted, really wanted to make that, uh, to work that up more. I might bring models in, not to copy the models, but to notice where I've gone funny or something like that, you know, where a proportion's funny or I didn't interpret the a form uh, Right, or even even in this case here, because I made those figures up and just sort of manufactured a light. I didn't have anybody showing me a light. So I could use the model and have her turn in the particular light and have all the models be in the same light and adjust each of those poses uh, to accommodate that unity of the light. But, but the value scheme I made up for myself, and you know, you have information about that stuff. For example, the idea of things getting, um, oh, and that's where I was going to show you this Jerome up here, things getting in the background getting less contrasty the rich the values getting more similar to each other so that that painting of the uh, masquerade the the, the uh, what's it called the the duel after the masquerade or something like that duel after the ball uh, has that feeling of having been painted out of his head uh, the figures in the background he didn't go outdoors uh, we or, i mean theoretically he might have but he could easily have done this using strategies like you know, your highest contrast in the foreground, the middle ground has the next level of contrastiness and levels of colors, color, 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 colorization, and the distance would all be more neutral and softer and whatever other thing you want to apply. And you can get that same sense of depth in the picture. So it's, it's, your, it's your imagination, it's, but you're always applying to nature to see if it's plausible. But you're not without resources, so that's why I mentioned the uh, the shadow box that um, that Poussin and these two are both Poussins. Even the top one could have been done from a shadow box, and with a shadow box, and the sky in the background could have been um, there could have been a light in the background, but there could have been a gauze with blue, you know, with, with blue light shining toward it to give you a sky, and then an actual another light, and I'd have no idea what kind of lights these guys were using, so my pres presumption is always that they're using daylight uh, through a window but you can cut windows or whatever into the sides of boxes and get your, and you can paint the insides of boxes to get the shadows the color you want, you know, to get the reflected lights the colors you want, uh, and thereby create an actual unity, uh, you know, that's, a, um, that's, that's inherently unified because you can see it sitting in front of you in a single light source, et cetera. But you can create, like, I get the sense even with Degas that he, he had things like in the, when you see the patterns frequently in the ballet people, you, they're cut out shapes that would have been uh, areas for, for ballet people to walk between, like it's the woods, so there'd be a passage of woods, and then the, model, the uh, ballerinas would walk 
like I'm running out from behind or between two or three sets of those flat. I think they were called flats, actually. In any case, you can see that you could do something like that with this whole middle ground. You could, you could just do a cutout or a piece of paper <laughs> and just look at what sort of things your values might want to do. But, but what I was beginning to say is that so much of this is trial and error on the canvas. So then when you get, for example, to the, this one by, um, by Leighton, I'm just going to talk about the color one, but he's trying to create a color scheme and not just painting from life to get the color. You follow on that one? And again, he's doing something that looks plausible to him, and then he's obviously improved it significantly. Well, to whatever degree we can see that either one of these is even like what he did. Uh, but you can see that he's also just using a trial and error approach to getting the colors to do what he wants. He said, well, let the skin be like this. And he paints you a slightly golden sort of skin tone, which if you go outdoors, is so common uh, unless somebody's sunburnt. People, we have a sense of a, the white man has a sort of a sense of waxiness about him, a yellowish effect. In any case, so he might have just said, let's do this note here. And you know, the sky is blue and you, you know, et cetera. And you begin, you know, before you know it, you're, you're around the thing, finding a color scheme you know, based not insignificantly on skin if the figure is a, such a leading thing, such a, such a prior, you know, such a major piece of the painting. And that applies coloristically as well. But you can do studies like that also with, um, so here's Millet doing these value studies that are, this case here, really worked up. The, um, the, 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 uh, the baker. Um, so this, this woman is shoving bread, it looks like, into the oven and uh, you can see the entire thing was like a finished values study, which leads to the idea of the grisaille. And, um, but the value study, uh, you can see that there's, a, again, you just look at it and try to make it plausible. Now, if you've got a, a years of working as an impressionist, you know what plausible is. That's say you, you have ideas. And especially if you painted a variety of things and don't just sit there and paint the same thing all the time. If you only paint still lives and never paint interiors, if you don't paint if you don't paint humans with drapery as well as, uh, um, um, uh, you know, just um, f the figure or portraits, you know, but the whole thing with the ensemble in the background begins to let you know, let you become an authority, at least in the sense of helping you with that thing called um, plausibility. In the case, though, of, of uh, Millet, though, he's doing everything out of his imagination. Oh, painting mania! Thank you very much for that image. <laughs> I didn't even see that on there. Um, but um, he's, um, but you can see that he's painting. Um, I, I mean, we know that he's painting out of his imagination. Uh, I, he, the, everything that he says says that he makes up the architecture of that building. He doesn't. He's mem everything he's doing is from memory. So if it's a room that looks like that, he's still doing it out of his imagination. And there's. As Degas would say, there's an inherent kind of a unity in working from your imagination. Um, yeah, and I, I best not say any more than that. Just the way it is. Um, so, what else can I say? But you can feel that the values are doing this harmonious thing. You can see again, it applies if he has that knowledge, and it appears that he does. Uh, it, it appears to be using the same mentality of the higher contrast in the foreground and the middle ground has lower level contrast and the background has lesser contrast yet. Uh, but in the same sense as the aerial perspective thing that Leonardo talks about. You know what, the knowledge that Leonardo had, a huge part of what the learning was in those days was to make a more plausible picture. It wasn't to get you out there painting from life. You were doing all these observations from life so that you can go into your studio, as the question was put here, and do an imaginative painting. But that's the base, there's a lot of knowledge like that. The idea of obscure in the shadows, you know, the, the drawing is less clear, the form, you know, the shadows, as eventually evolves, the shadows are at, for atmosphere. In other words, they are, they tend to flatness and, and opacity, opaquity, whatever, <laughs> that's the right word, isn't it? Uh, they don't actually, have translucency, but I, so I'm not using quite the right word, uh, but obtuseness might be a better word, like my speech today. Um, uh, but nevertheless, you can you can follow that that same model can be used indoors. And by the way, the Hudson River School is full of formulas like that. So here's this Degas where you can see he's doing something like what I would call a grisaille. And you don't see this every time out. 
by any stretch. And I don't know to what extent they were even every time out in this first, in these earlier pictures. But um, but you can see what he's done down here with this one. Now he's he's done a whole bunch of embellishing and, and admiring, you know, working with. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Getting you ahead, getting you ahead of us. But uh, but you can see what he's done. He's got these drawings all set. Eventually, he adds foreground to it. He crops it differently. You can see this cropping, this this anti uh, uh, Angian cropping. <laughs> And he adds a figure in over here, but you can see he's still designing. He's still designing the picture. Now, one of the things about this is the unity that's most important is pictorial unity. It has to look like, the, like for example, the darks have to do beautiful things together. The spotting of the lights, all all this stuff, and their sizes, and the, the variety that you're creating in the movement through the picture, and all that sort of stuff. That's the real unity you want. But you want the plausibility of the day. So, but you look at the one on the right you know, of the moment in time, whether or not you're an Impressionist, whether or not you're painting from nature, it has to give us some level of plausibility so you can really clearly see what Degas was saying. Uh, when he mentions that idea of being um, ar artifice. But the one in the bottom right, you can see that wall is just made up. Whatever he's doing, actually, I don't know what's happening there. I wonder if somebody's messed with this picture. It's so much online, you don't see things until you're holding them up. I don't recall. It might have been there. I don't recall these bars down under here, so... I don't know what that is, but nevertheless, you can see he's created a value scheme. And, um, and the values can do a lot of things. For example, in nature, this floor could have been stained way darker. It could have been lighter. The wall could have been any color you want. So hugely, when you're an imaginative painter, your entire scheme has to do with the expression. So you might say, let's let this be a much more neutral. You could say this is a more feminine picture. The one up top has all this mechanics about it. You know, it feels more things and stuff and bang and whack and you know this has got more grace elegance uh um for lack of a better word it's got a a finesse a feminine kind of a finesse to my mind which which you know in the shallow range it's very beautiful aesthetically in one place that the other one and so you see the value range is fairly limited comparatively mostly a light picture this is mostly a middle tone picture by the way that's another one of the discussions you have with yourself you say to yourself is this going to be a middle tone picture a dark picture or a light picture and of course there are ranges there but the total effect is the value the value is not just well this light that's not the value of the picture the, the whole thing taken together is value x now you can see if you blur your eyes a little bit that this one here is a darker picture than this one here right and these are things you're choosing so there's that and then you'd maintain it you live within that range and make sure that you're not leaving your leaving town or whatever. But that's just one of the things you'll have in mind that may give you some some sort of a, a, a better handle on the unity to know that. Otherwise, you'll just be pushing all kinds of stuff. But if you know what the range is of your darkest dark and lightest light and what the general tonality of the picture is. And you can do scribbles, as I've shown on some of the videos, to just get an idea what the general value of a picture is and the distribution, therefore. And Degas is a master of this kind of conversation. So the, uh, the I think this is the last one I'm going to show you, but we all know about the oyster gatherers of Calais being an imaginative painting. Now this is the easiest one to do in the world because you got the he's she's, he's obviously painting the figures in the same spot more or less, it, with the same. So he's got the same beach, he's got the same kind of sort of sunny day, and he's got he's got people and he's doing studies of guys that he's eventually going to just piece together. But he's doing color studies of them. Not drawings, although he has some scribbles, some some liney, very liney scribbles um, that I've seen for this. But you get the you get a pretty clear idea. He's getting his unity actually from nature. So every time he hits a color note here on the leg, he's getting it right to the beach and to this dark is dark. And so if these guys sort of stay the same, then when he hits these notes in through here and they're right to these two or three notes, then they'll be right to this person who's also right to this this and shall we say this note. And again, don't trust these drawings to be precisely right, but there are enough data, there's enough data there for him to build an entire picture on. And by the way, on the other hand, he could, he could easily have gone out there with this in mind of just simply putting, uh, doing the landscape that was out there, having already these drawings, and, but having it largely laid in, or he could have done his isolated study of this out there. He's got enough information between the clouds here and the rest of the beach as it shows and rocks and things over here. And I have seen other studies with this stuff in it, but I think this little guy shows up with but you can see he's got a fixed background. So the color values are all fixed and he can live with that and get everything right by unity because he knows how to relate the givens, every part of this of the figure here to the givens. This dark shall be this, the beach color value will be that, sky is this, 
and then these other notes are what they are because of that. So the lighter light on this thing here becomes the lightest light in the picture, but um, probably he already knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Maybe because he had it up here already or some such thing. Anyway, yeah. That's, that's that conversation. And I think that's what I have for you today. So, um, but the main, the main thing though is plausibility and that's something that's in you. <clears throat> so trust yourself, but do a bunch of these things and then look for more information. Uh, yeah. So as much as I don't want to, I didn't really want to fixate on this thing. I think I will just for a second longer talk about that. Uh, but what you have there is a picture that was laid in out there on the spot. And it wasn't anything I was satisfied with, although it was, it was better than some of the other ones <laughs> I'd been out there doing. But I was just fascinated with standing in a spot like that and, uh, and, and in the sort of the drama of the waterfall. But I have frankly been one of those guys who's never been satisfied with the waterfall. It's, you know, I prefer to actually liven it up with a human being. And, uh, but so this is an example of something painted from life and then the figures simply made up and painted over it from my imagination. Eventually I evolved, and it's way too big to bring in here, but I evolved a big picture based on a color scheme that I thought up, um, which is just beautiful in color, it's looking for something beautiful. And I think my original piece of it was a little pastel with a few notes on it, about that big. And I decided what everybody was, and that was a decision I made later. But right here I was just trying to get these guys to look plausible, some plausible color in the water down there. Whether I achieved that or not is a whole other story. Should they have been more golden, et cetera, you know? And I say that meaning, was it, would it have been more plausible, but obviously I haven't spent as much time, and you could, this is what, one of those things you could do, have a model come out with you to the beach and just note the skin colors, and, which I could have done before, but once I've done this much of a study, I could then follow up with all that sort of thing. But the only way you can get it is, is to do it, to put notes down exper experimentally and look at it and, and, and ask if it's plausible. So that's just me. I'm not, a, I'm not an imaginative painter. Uh, I, I'm only saying what's off the cuff and what you would naturally conclude, I think, in lots of ways, too. The guys you want to talk to or anybody who's working in, in, in the imaginative world, I'm talking about now the, the illustrators you know that are good, um, you know, and just see what they know. Pick their minds. But they're doing stuff that's much more specific um, on an everyday basis to that way of working. Lots and lots of stuff, as you saw in the Ang, in the Ang, I could have put Ang paintings up here and Ang's color studies too, by the way. But what you heard in the Ang conversation, all that same stuff applies in both ways of thinking, the idea of getting the unity of the whole. You have to keep watching the whole, the whole time you're working. And uh, because that's the only way it's going, when you get to the end, you're going to have unity if you're watching the whole. But you say, I got to paint three and five things and none of them looks quite right or they're all painted and whatever, you know, randomly, you're going to have a mess. So you're, it's always going to be something you're relating to. And you always have to be look, having in mind some larger thing. So that's one of the other things I'd put to you, and that is make sure you have a, a preliminary sketch of some sort, a, a, an idea. That's not what this one is. The idea came later after this one. I was just having some fun painting figures in a picture I was going to, about to throw in the trash <laughs> or, or, or cover and paint, uh, put another painting on. All right, I better get out of here. So this has been a lot of fun, uh, and again, I, I want to give tribute to, to Gamble, but, uh, but again, thank you all for your donations, comments, thanks for these coming in. I, I see a lot of new voices out there, I'm really pleased, and I'm also seeing a lot of you guys from the past that keep on coming. You know, I, I, I won't start mentioning your names because I'll miss somebody, but, but, I, but, but each one of you means something to me uh, in, and to this conversation. So, and I've gotten to know your, you and where you're coming from, and it's really been helpful. So the more you bring to the the more you bring to me, the more this conversation is uh, useful. Uh, and I can direct it better and that sort of thing. So, yeah. All right. Well, this has been good. And uh, thanks to Mr. Gamble. Uh, again, I want to just honor Mr. Gamble uh, for, the, um, for what he contributed, to my knowledge, and uh, for being there as a professional working every day on these pictures, done Gamble's way. Maybe I should uh, set up and just show that those his pictures for the uh, end with his one of his paintings here. Yeah, that's pretty fun. And uh, yeah, but the fact is, Gamble was a solid professional who really gave you a sense of what that meant. Always there in the room, always thinking this through, reading, studying, always in the museum, looking at pictures. Um, 
yeah, very very model of what we want to be, uh, or or how you're going to get a measure of success. But he all he all of us wanted to be in this field, but he made it something you respected and that you 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 could actually um, uh, um, allow yourself to embody because you now had a sense of it in a living person, and that'll be your job for the next generation as well. All right. I'll see you in the next one. I hope you guys have a wonderful new year. Uh, I hope only the best for everybody. Uh, lots of strange things are happening on the earth today. Uh, lots of it not very good. Uh, I'm very aware of that. But I do um, hope and pray for the best for each of you in all parts of the world. I know some of you are struggling under things that this country, that my, my country has caused in your parts of the world. It's not good. Um, but we ourselves are now becoming victims of the same, some of the same garbage. So uh, I'm, I'm only saying I really, uh, I really wish the best. And uh, I hope you have a very good new year and hope you can actually create, and despite all the craziness out there, some level of success and progress in your own careers. And keep bringing the love. <laughs> all right, talk to you later. Thank you.